Deuteronomy 28 chapter, starting in verse 9. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as, as he has sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, thou shalt not borrow. Come on and read verse 13 with me. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And let me give you a parallel scripture from 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, the New Testament parallel. Or the parallel, at least for me in this message, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And I'm reading, this is the King James Version. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Lord, bless the preaching, the teaching, the hearing, and the doing of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm continuing today with a subject that I started two weeks ago entitled Living Above Average. And again, thank God to all, for all of you who came out for Founders Day and have sold into our lives and blessed us and gave me handwritten cards and, and, and uh, purchased Hallmark cards. I've read every card and I shook every card. So I want to tell you I thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, one, I took one of my, one, for, for my birthday, uh, one of my daughters, uh, she, she, they, they had a card from her and the kids. And so I, she got, got the card, uh, got, let me see, what did I do? Yeah, uh, got the card and I immediately opened it. And she said, you got to read the outside first. I said, oh, yeah, I'm so used to going to the inside. She, she, she got to read the outside first because the inside doesn't make sense unless you read the outside. Thank you. I read all the cards, the inside and the outside. Thank you so much for sowing into our lives. Living above average is the subject of this teaching that I started a couple weeks ago. And so I said I, I, that I've observed, especially uh, during, the, during all the, the mourning and the national mourning of, uh, of Great Britain and of the Commonwealth those who still identify as being part of the commonwealth of Great Britain. Uh, the, all the media coverage, the commentary, the correspondence, the pomp and circumstances surrounding the death of Great Britain's monarch, I couldn't observe, I couldn't help but observe that this is no ordinary person, not the average person, not the average country, not the average family. And everything you saw reminded you that this was not average. Even the hearse, that wasn't just one of the ones in the fleet from the funeral home. That was a hearse that Jaguar, which is originally a British company, specifically designed to carry the coffin of the Queen of England. Specifically designed. And we said that average is defined, is defined as typical when you consider a group. It, it, average is not out of the ordinary. Average is common. Average is being about midway between extremes. Let me use a, a younger, more contemporary term. Average is basic. And so I gave you some statistics about the average person. We saw her, that was Jessica, who, was, who, we, who we said uh, she was about 30 to 34 years old, 32 years old. Uh, born in 89, in 89, lives in California, five foot five, brunette, mother of two. And unless you fall into that category, you're not even average based upon them putting together all these stats about the demographics of Americans. And so 
we discovered that the scripture says, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament, is letting us know that God's people are not supposed to be just average. Look at somebody say, I'm not just average. We're supposed to live above average because God tells his people, I'm going to make you to be the head, not the tail. Okay, I'm going to make you to be above only. A lot of times I hear people quote that scripture and say, I'll call it to be above, but, but every time I, it says above only. That, that challenges our faith. I'm supposed to be above only. So I'm not supposed to be, as I grew up hearing in the church, sometimes up and sometimes down and almost level to the ground. No, I'm supposed to be above only. Come on, come. So you got to, anything that tries to pull you down and pull you back, you got to take authority over that. You got to rebuke that. You got to tell, remind that, oh, no, 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 devil. I ain't going back. I, I'm not going down. I'm not decreasing. I'm not diminishing. I'm not receding. I'm progressing. I'm elevating. I'm going higher because I'm to be above only and not beneath. But he said, in order to do that, I have to hearken to his commandments. And, you know, you have people today debating about whether you got to do the stuff that the Old Testament says you're supposed to do. And regarding Levitical laws and, and to be saved and, to, and the bulls and, and Levitical laws of how you, how you sacrifice, all that was taken care of by Jesus. But there are principles of God's word that will cause you to live above average. Principles. It's not a law. You don't have to do it. It's certain things, if you do it or not do it, has nothing to do with heaven or hell. You'll go to heaven, but if you want to live above average, you're going to have to do God's things God's way. I know I live an above average life. I don't apologize for it. I don't, I don't apologize. That, that, that's why a couple weeks ago, when they, because of something that some preacher did or some legs happened in New York City, that a local tel, local. Um, radio program uh, in, the, in the afternoon and they wanted me and a couple other pastors to come on and talk about is it all right for preachers to live well now mo most people would try to stay away from all they're going to try to get me you can't get me if i was going to get got i would have got got a long time ago you can't get me i know i'm supposed to be above average but here's the deal not because i'm a preacher I'm supposed to be above that because I'm a child of God. If it's only working for the preacher, that's gimmick. Let me say that again. If it's only working for the preacher, that's gimmick. But if you apply the same principles to your life that I apply to my life, if you apply the same principle to your business that I apply to my ministry, if you apply the same principle to your family that I apply to my family based upon the word of God, what's happening for me ought to be happening for you, and what's happening for you ought to be happening for me, and we all ought to be above average. But God said, so you have to obey my commandments, and what that means for us today is live by principles of the word. Live by principles of the word. There was an artist who was performing this week, and uh, we had invited this artist a while back and didn't quite go right, the business side of it. And one of my friends, I, I guess, who was at the conference, they were ministering, singing, and I was thinking about that thing. I was thinking about it. And he walks up to me, all these people, taps me in the shoulder and says, have you forgiven her? I said, what? He said, you know I hear God, right? He said, have you forgiven her? I said, I, I, of course. He said, the Lord said, you got to forgive her. So one of the prints of God's word is that if I'm going to bless you, you don't have to forgive people. Some of y'all used to worry about your finances. God said, your finances increasing that bill getting paid is on the other side of you forgiving the person who owe you some money all these are principles of the kingdom and then first peter tells us he says ye god's people you are a chosen generation 
God has, oh, and, and I've been rejoicing thinking about that recently. I'm preaching about it Thursday night when I went out to uh, Pastor Johnny White's church, the Kingdom of Vision. Thank God for those who came there. But David rejoiced because he was chosen. He was chosen. Of all the people that could be king, God chose me. My father wouldn't even choose me, and God chose me. My brothers despised me, and God chose me. That's why he could boldly write, when my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will be there to take me up. You're chosen, your holiness, you're peculiar. Your peculiar means you're special, and you're supposed to be intentionally different. He said the reason why God chose you and made you different is so you can dis be distinguished from above others and show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Now, they're still in darkness, but he called you out of darkness. They're still in sin, but he called you out of sin. They're still in doubt, fear, and unbelief, and living by the dictates of this world and by the dictates of their flesh, but he called you out of darkness. Somebody say he called me out. And so for that reason, we are supposed to be above average, not mediocre, not basic in every area of our life. We're chosen, we're royal, we're holy, we're peculiar. So the first thing we said, you can live average because you're chosen. Second thing is I move on today. You can live average because you've been raised up. Somebody say, I've been raised up. Come on, say it, say it like you really believe. Say, I've been raised up. You need, to, you need to conceptualize that. You need to internalize that. I've been raised up. I've been raised up. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 4 through 6, it says, but God. Prior verses, he was saying we were dead and trespassed on sin. We was bound. We, 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 you know, we had the monkey on our back. We were addicted. We, we were doing whatever our flesh told us to do, whatever we were grown enough to do, whatever culture told us to do. We, were, we did what we were naughty by nature. We were sinless. We were, we were uh, bound in sin. But he, then he said, God has quickened us. In Ephesians 2, pick, verse 4, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy. I'm so glad God's rich in mercy. Because most of us, we ain't rich in mercy. Some of us are rich in, <laughs> richer in money than we are in mercy. Okay? okay. What, what, what you mean by that, Pastor? How many times do you say, you got one more time? <laughs> you got one more time. Now, why you say that? Because you're not rich in mercy. Better yet, you say, this is the last time. That's because you're not rich in mercy but I'm so glad that God is rich in mercy because he's been using it since Adam <laughs> and all the generations and the millions of people who were born in, six, in preceding generation before I ever got here I'm so glad he didn't run out of mercy that when I messed up that semester or two and I said God I'm sorry he said too late. I've run out of mercy. But he's rich in mercy. That means he has an abundant supply that never runs out. His loving nature causes him to always replenish in mercy. One scripture says that his mercies are new every morning. He's rich in mercy. And because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, even when we were living a rebellious life, he made us alive together with Christ, and then he throws it in here. You know, it's by grace you're saved. You, didn't, you couldn't have done this yourself. You didn't think of this yourself. By grace you saved. Here we go. Verse 6, and he did what? And he raised us up together. Oh, my God. He raised us up together. So I know I may have been saved longer than you, and there's some people here have been saved longer than me, but you haven't been raised up higher than me. He raised us up together. So in the kingdom of God, there are no big eyes and little U's, and, 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 and I've been here longer than you, and I got saved long before you, and I've been in a way long for you, and God hears my prayers more than he hears your prayers. He raised us up together, and we all have equal access to the Father, and we all have the right to have our prayers answered, and we all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because he's raised us up together.
Some people don't understand why we need corporate worship, especially in this era of streaming and technology, okay? I think I read somebody said this, and some people want to debate about that. You can't debate this. That Tony Evans made a statement. He said, uh, he said no, you don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to have a, go to church to be saved. No more do you have to go home to be married. But if you don't go home, it's definitely going to affect the relationship. Am I right about it? You, you're married when you're at work. You're married when you go on vacation. You're married when you hang with the fellas. You're married when you hang with your girls. Okay? You're married when, when you go, when you, when you, all the swat of women get together and you go see the woman king. Okay? But you got to go home and get together with your husband, your wife, if this relationship is going to thrive. And one of the reasons why we have corporate worship is because we have something, the Bible, that we use the word in the English, fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. It's connecting on a spiritual level with which I cannot connect with anyone else. Now, people don't like this. People don't like this. But black people connect with other black people in a way we can't connect with other people. Italian people connect with Italian people in a way they can't connect with the folks on Italian. Jewish people connect with, with people regarding their history and their trauma in ways they can't connect with other people. Christians connect with Christians in a way we can't connect with other people. You are a chosen generation. You are a holy nation. You are peculiar people. And when we get together, man, yeah, man, the Lord delivered me too. He healed me too. He saved me too. He raised me. And we can testify and shout about things together that other folks can't relate to. Often we, we, we even got, we got our Christianese language. Our folks don't understand our Christianese. How you doing, blessed and highly favored? <laughs> now, unless you're a Christian, know what blessing is, highly favored, that, that don't mean nothing to you. We, we connect on a level, and, and families get together. I especially notice, notice this when uh, Pastor Marsha got together with her, and it's still the same way when her sister comes out here. It, we, we hear the same stories. <laughs> you know how his family did it? You remember when you was five? And <laughs> these traumatic stories. <laughs> and that mouse got caught in your head bonnet. And you're running around. And there you get, even though you hear the same stories, you connect on a level because you have the same experience. For you to thrive as Christian, you need to get together with folks who understand your story. Mm. You need to get together with people who understand what deliverance is. You need to get together with people who understand what grace is. You need to get together with people who understand what the blood is. Oh, my God. I'm reminded uh, when I when I camped Pastor, Pastor Dwayne several years ago, we had, a, we had a, a, a vehicle, church vehicle that he used to use to go down to Florence, uh, Florence or wherever he was going right that night. But uh, uh, I came home, Pastor Chay was driving me home, and uh, I got a call. I got a call uh, that he, his vehicle, the vehicle had flipped over on 378 over here in Lexington. Or West, yeah. The vehicle had flipped over and was laying in somebody else's yard. And when I got there, I saw the vehicle flipped over from the road, flipped over somebody's road, and Pastor Dwayne was standing over the side. And so, before I got there, they said, all they know is this vehicle flipped up, this guy got out, and he was going, ah, yeah, yeah. And so when I got there, an officer said, he said he was jumping around. He said, I was telling him, you shouldn't do that. I said, yes, he should. Yeah, see, he don't understand. He don't understand. See, this, you need to come here where you can, ah, yeah. 
And folks said, no, you shouldn't. Oh, yes, I should. If, if you understood what deliverance was, if you understood what the blood does, if you understood that I went through some things this week and the devil tried to take me out and I got to shout and I got to pray and I got to run, you may even be living with somebody who don't understand it. But when you get here in the house of the Lord, when all God's children get together, a praise rings out that nobody understands but somebody who recognizes that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, the enemy would have swallowed me up. We're peculiar people. We're different. You don't, have, you don't understand that. And I, I got to get together with my people. <laughs> we are a holy nation. And then I got to get together with my people. We connect on a level I can't explain. Okay? I don't eat chitlins no more. Okay? I ate them as a kid because I didn't know what I was eating. A lot of kids eat stuff they don't know what they eat. I don't eat. But black folks... Like you, some of you blacks, y'all can connect on some chitlins. When I said chitlins and hot sauce, some of y'all said, yes, Lord. Now that's what I'm talking about right there. Your head gets to shaking. When I think. Now one thing I do know, one thing I know, mama said, you can't eat everybody chitlins. Did your mama say that too? Because everybody don't clean them right. I literally remember as a kid, these things sitting in the sink, and I had to scrape. What's the difference between a hog maw and the chitlin? Hog maws and chitlins. See, y'all all the same. We had hog maws and chitlins. And I had to scrape. But that, that, those are certain things that we have in common based upon experience. We are a holy nation. We are peculiar people. And so that's why the Bible tells us as his people, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is. He raised us up. He didn't raise everybody up. He raised us up. Oh, glory to God. And made us, plural, to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So I know it... To you, it may look like I'm right here with y'all, but I'm really up here. I'm talking to the sinner now. It may look like we're all the same, but we ain't the same because I've been raised up. I know, I know, I know we work at the same job, we got the same title, and we got the same position, but you just don't know I've been raised up. See, I work here, but this ain't my source because I've been raised up. And my income is not limited based upon what the state decides to give me or the company decides to give me as a raise. See, I have unlimited income because I've been... Oh, come on now. See, you got to recognize who you are. You got to recognize what it is to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. He raised us up. We may all look like we're the same, but th those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior, he has raised us up. Just sit in the heavenly place with Christ Jesus. First Samuel, second chapter, verse seven and eight. It says this, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. Now we already know how he, how he does this. He said, you want to be brought low? Get in pride. You want to be brought low? Fail to give me the glory. You want to be brought low? Talk about what you've done with the might of your power, with your ingenuity and your hands, and give all the credit to your degree and your upbringing. God said, oh, I'll bring you low. But I also will lift up. And who will I lift up? Humble yourself before the almighty hand of God that in due season he will lift you up. So in the kingdom of God, the way up is down. Let me say that again. In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. 
the more I humble myself and the more I recognize I need him, the more I depend upon him and the more I lift him up, then the more he lifts me up. Are y'all with me here? So he makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. And I love this because this is my testimony. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. Oh, my God. To set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Why? For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. It said, I don't care what your background is. There's a promise from God, I don't care how poor you were. And you know, sometimes people like to tell, so I need you to let you know how poor I was. I mean, I was so poor, we didn't run the water. I mean, I was so poor, we ate in the outhouse. I mean, I was so poor, we had all had hammer down clothes. I was so poor. And sometimes we, wanna, we, want, we want to uh, try to uh, uh, explain to people the depths of our poverty, but it does not matter. The promise is he raises the poor from the dust. I don't care where you started, God can raise you up. It's not limited upon being in America. It's not limited upon trusting in a black man or the white man, the Democrats or the Republican. If you trust God and believe his word and live by his word, God can raise you up. Raises the poor from the dust. When, when, when my sister-in-law came here back in 1996 and we were riding through Ascot subdivision over here in Irmo, which, which was the most exclusive area, I think it probably still is, even, they've even built more since we've been there, and we didn't even own a home, and we're riding in that 19, 1987, I believe, van, that I couldn't afford to get the brakes fixed in. So because I couldn't afford the brakes, now we're down on the rotors. If you know anything about that subdivision, you go down the street at uh, Staple Ridge Road where we wish to live, and you ride, it's called Ascot Estate, and you ride so many, so many yards or, or feet, and then there's a stop sign. About four, just going to, yeah, just, just stop sign. And every stop sign, I couldn't, I would press the brakes and the brakes would go. Like, I told you to get me fixed. <laughs> we kind of do rolling stops. Very unsafe. <laughs> See, some, sometimes if you don't know the blood kept you for anything else, you need to thank God for, keeping you, for, for the blood keeping you when you didn't get your brakes fixed. And I told, we had just started our ministry didn't have great income, church didn't have great income, but I know it was in the will of God. We're down there at 3801 River Drive that I, we took $10,000, $5,000 that we sold and the church gave another five to renovate the place and put up some sheetrock and try to make the place look nice with, with, my, with, with my sound equipment from Radio Shack and my Casio keyboard from the pawn shop right down the street here. And we riding through this neighborhood and I told my sister, law one day you're going to come back here and we'll be living in this neighborhood. And she laughed. She laughed. And I'm not saying that because it, it seemed funny. We were so far away from that. We didn't own a house. So how are you going to not go from not owning a house to owning a house in this neighborhood? And you can't even get your brakes fixed. Oh, come on, come on, come on. But I know that the word says he raises the poor from the dust. I may be in the dust right now, but the dust is being shaken off my feet and I'm getting on the elevator and I may be on the first floor now, but there's a whole lot more floors in this elevator and God is raising me up right now. Come on, if you believe God's raising you up right now, give him a praise that he's raising you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's raising you up. He's raising you up. He's raising you up. He's 
though your beginning was small. Be seated. He raises, he raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the beggar. Give me a little more on this. Lifts the beggar from the ash heap. It doesn't matter where you are right now. You are a peculiar people. You're not supposed to be average when God has raised you up. But it starts with your thinking. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. Let me give you one more. You can live above average. The scripture says, because you are royal. Oh my God. Well, no, no, I, I didn't know my father. And, and my mother was this. But see, you're just thinking of yourself from your natural lineage. You have to start identifying, listen to me, more with your spiritual identity than your natural identity. You have to identify more with being part of the kingdom of God than even being an American citizen. Because the average American, or the American is average. The, the world compares, this is, this is, the world compares their standard of living by the average American. I don't know if y'all realize that. So everybody's goal is to try to live like the average American. My goal is not to be the average American. My goal is to be everything God wants me to be. Have everything God wants me to have. Do everything that God's called me to do and not to blend in. I'm not supposed to blend. You're not supposed to be a blender. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be standing out. You can live above that because you're royal. Royal means to be royal, you have to have kingly ancestry. Kingly ancestry or marry into it, Megan. And don't mess it up. Shut up. Do what you're supposed to do. But the problem is, uh, you can't be royal when you're thinking like an American. That's the problem. I said to someone the other day, they said, but I said, see, you're thinking like an American. We don't understand people's honor for Queen Elizabeth. We don't, we, we, we see people crying in the streets. We don't understand that. But yet there were people here crying when Dr. King died. Everybody didn't cry. There were people who were on the streets crying when Kennedy was assassinated. To be royal, you have to have kingly ancestry or be connected to the family. Revelation 1 and 6. Am I helping you all today? I'm trying to change your mentality of how you think. Revelation 1 and 6 says, he has made us. Here we see this us again. So it's not preachers. It's not bishops. It's not apostles. It's all of us who name the name of Jesus. He has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him and, and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen he's made us kings and priests come on somebody say I'm a king and I'm a priest come on somebody some of you some of y'all well, I'm a female what you just heard you know there's a woman king right look at somebody say I'm a woman king a woman the Lord knew I was going to preach this, so I had to he, let the movie come out so you can understand the word. He's made us kings and priests to his God and father to him. Be, he's made us kings and priests. So I don't care where you're born. I don't care what little country town you're from. I don't care what down by town you're from. Because some, some of us, you know, nobody, can, nobody know our town. So he asked you where you're from. You said, well, down by Charleston. <laughs> where you from? Oh, 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 down by Greenville. My daughter back in the day had a friend who was from Little Africa. See, some of y'all ain't heard from Little Africa. See, that's, that, that was her town right there. There's Little Africa, South Carolina. How many of y'all knew Little Africa? Now, just because a whole bunch of black people in your neighborhood, that don't mean there's Little Africa. 
Lord, this looks like Blue Africa. <laughs> it's in the upstate. There's a town called Little Rap. And some, some, I don't care what little town you're from, what little village you're from. I want you to see that because you got saved, God has made us kings and priests. Kings walk different. Kings act different. Kings is something in the way they do like this. I'll tell you all to see that. King Charles did that. He was giving a sign, something, and some papers were in the way. And he looked at people and said, Right, man, hold on a minute. You've only been king for a minute. <laughs> He's made us kings and priests. Revelation 19 and 16, I want you to catch this. It's reference to Jesus. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is what? King of kings and Lord of lords. Now we know he's not, well, you will know after I make this point. He's not talking about merely the kings of this earth. Because when Jesus' disciples told him, he said, Lord, why don't we just, uh, uh, when he said, are you a king? Are you a king? During his prosecution leading to the cross. He said, thou sayest I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdoms were of this world, then my servants would fight. He said, my kingdom was of this world. You wouldn't have me restrained right now. So the kingdom that he is of, king of, is the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, I just read you a scripture, the first scripture from Revelation 1. Said, he made us kings and priests. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Watch this. But we're the kings. And he's our king. And he's catching. it. He ain't talking about the world. He's not talking about the kingdoms of this world. Because one day all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of, of our Lord and of his Christ. He's saying he's our king. But we got to see yourself as kings. He's the king. I don't care how great we are. He's still the king of kings. But I want you to see that you are royalty. You're not supposed to be average. You represent the kingdom of God. You dominate in this earth. Whatever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be. You shall decree a thing. Kings decree. Kings decree. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. All this has to do with how you think. Once you get the revelation, oh, I got to move on here. Oh, yeah, I got to move on. Oh, but here's a point I got to get to here. So you can't really live above average until you accept the fact that you're not supposed to be average. And since you're not average, it's perfectly acceptable and expected by the Father for you to live above average. It should be obvious and understandable that royals live above average. Average. Do y'all agree with that? And if we are royal priesthood, we're supposed to be living above that. He made us a, a, a he made us kings and priests unto our God. People live above average are not just barely making it. People live above average are not struggling. And once you accept and realize and internalize this truth, no devil in hell will be able to hold you down and keep you back. Let me say it again. When you realize, accept, and even, here's a deeper word, internalize. I mean, get it down on the inside of you. When Pastor Moss was talking this morning, during the, during the exhortation, about when children sing songs, it starts getting internalized, which is why all of you now got to be watching what you let your kids watch and listen to. My son sent me something the other day. From, it was Blue's Clues, but went, to blue, blues, went to, from Blue's Clues to Blue's Clues Gay uh, Pride Parade. And got kids singing about being, being about two mothers and two fathers and being non-binary and pan and everything else. 
So you have to watch what your children are hearing, what they're seeing. You have to teach them their identity, their identity from Christ's perspective. Once you accept and realize and internalize this truth, God's raised me up. I'm not supposed to be above average. I live above average. I'm the head, not the tail. I've been raised up. I'm a holy nation, peculiar people, a royal priesthood. I've been made a, a nation of kings and priests. He's raised me up to sit with him in heavenly places. No devil in hell can hold you back. I don't care what administration comes. Uh, y'all, I want y'all to get, catch this. Y'all, I don't deny racism and sexism and all the other isms. But if God be for you, who can be against you? The greater one lives on the inside of you. Stop waiting for man to do for you what God has already done for you. Oh my God. For he whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. Once David, I'll quit with this. Uh, Exodus 1 and 12, it says that the Egyptians tried to oppress God's people. But look at this. The, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Oh my, you can't afflict me, oppress me to the point that you can keep me from multiplying. If I realize who I am and whose I am and whom I serve, in fact, I've been raised up. And the more they multiplied and grew and they were in dread of the children of Israel, just what God promised. He said, I'll make you the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath, and they shall be afraid of you. Look, somebody say, I'm scared of you. So don't, so, oh my God. That's why you're on that job and you just got there and you're being nice and sweet and kind, but folks scared of you. They so afraid you're going to take their job. You've been there a month. They've been there for five years. But they're afraid of you because they see something in you that they can say, oh, look like they got promotion all over them. Look like they got increase all over them. Oh, it look like they're getting favor on them. Look, the boss talking to them and giving them special assignment. Oh, they walking in favor even though they don't even know that it's called favor. They, they calling you a pet, but you know it's the favor of God. They, they think you kissing up to somebody. And it's not that you kissing up to anybody. God is kissing you because you are the apple of his eye. And he's showing forth his love towards you. And they are afraid of you. <laughs> and they're supposed to be afraid of you. That's right, be scared. That's right, be scared. Be scared. I don't got to I don't have to do nothing. You need to be scared of me. Because I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I'm a peculiar people. I got the favor of God. God raised me up to sit in heavenly pick with Christ. I am royalty. That's why you need to be afraid of me. Who Jesus? When I got fired from my job back in March 7th, 1997, I didn't know what God was going to do. Oh, but I just knew they're going to regret this. I didn't know how God was going to defend me, but I knew God going to defend me. I knew he would make my enemies my footstool. I know he's the great equalizer. I know he make all things right. I know that many of the afflictions are the righteous, but he shall deliver me out of them all. Oh, let me quit with this. Once David internalized that he was indeed the new king. Everybody say internalize it. Internalize it means it, it's, it's not just an outward truth. It's part of who you are. You receive this truth on the inside of you. It's like it comes a certain age. My, my, one of my grandsons, I, th he, I think he's starting to understand now. I said they're going to have this boy so confused. He's just going to have this boy so confused. Because his government name is Daniel Nelson Bailey Jr. I call him DJ. His daddy called him Banks. So we got DJ. We got Banks. 
And then he's gone to school now, and they start calling him Daniel. And at one point, he said, I ain't Daniel. <laughs> I respond to Banks. I respond to DJ. My daddy is Daniel. But he's getting a little older now. And now that he's getting older, he's, you ask him name now, he said, my name is Daniel Bailey. There comes a time you don't need nobody to tell you who you are. There's a come to time you got to mature that you know who you are. I don't care what you call me. I know who I am. I don't care what it looks like to you. I know who I am. I don't have to prove anything to you. Can I tell you? Can I, you know, I was hearing this for years. I was, I was, I was hearing this for years. I, I, I first heard Oprah say it. I heard Oprah say years ago they gave her a 60th birthday party. And John Travolta was there. And, they did all this. and she said the wonderful thing about being 60, you stop thinking about what other people think about you. And, and uh, I got there in my 50s, in my late 50s, so I'm really celebrating it right now. I'm at a place in my life, I ain't trying to impress nobody. I mean, I'm grown, grown. I mean, like, groany, grown, grown, grown. It is what it is. I am who I am. You can like me, you can hate me, but I am all right with me because God is all right with me. And if you don't like me, it's okay. I ain't, I'm not a little child on the kindergarten a recess playground. Will you be my friend? I am a friend of God. I ain't trying to make new friends. Either you're my friend or you're not. I'm, look at somebody say, I'm grown, grown. You got to guess get where, you, where you know who you are. And to some degree, some of you, you know, and, and, and I get it, you all have to go through it, but this teaching can help some of you. And I get it. I get it. Some of you younger people, you're in environments, and especially the corporate environment, and, uh, you know, where, 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 you know, where you, you, you're trying to be accepted, and you're still trying to wear, you got to wear your hair a certain way, and you got to speak a certain way, and you're still, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, what's, what's it called, code switching between your professional voice and your hood voice, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're going back and forth, and that, I'm telling y'all, that is a lot of pressure. That's a lot of stress. It's just something to get to the place and be able to work somewhere. This is who I is. Like it or not, this is who I am. And if you don't promote me, it's okay. Because I'm going to go where I'm celebrated, not just tolerated. And that's why so many people are starting their own companies. Because really, I just, I just can't do it. This is too much pressure to try to please you and please this one and like this one and like that. Wear my hair this way, talk this way, try, try to put my butt in, try to put my butt out. This is just too much. It is who I am. And the devil don't like it when you're blessed like that. Ain't nothing I can do about it. Is what my mama made. You gotta get to the place, I gotta quit, y'all. But you gotta get to the place, you gotta just internalize who I am. I internalize who I know who I am. I know what God made me to be. Okay? And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, 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 you know I'll, I'll follow the protocols, but I can't change me. Can't change me. For you. Once David internalized he was indeed the new king, watch this y'all, he behaved differently. So he was anointed king, God called him to be king, uh, Samuel anointed him king, but he wasn't convinced yet. Second Samuel 5, 12 and 13, and I'll quit here. It says David realized, the other translation says perceived, I think the original translation says perceived. When David perceived internal knowing that the Lord had confirmed him as king, that he really was raised up, that he really was royalty, that the Lord had confirmed him king over Israel and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people after moving from Hebron to Jerusalem. I'm reading New Living Translation. 
He moved from Hebron to Jerusalem. David married more concubines and wives, and they had more sons and daughters. Just so you don't lose the revelation with the illustration, that last part don't apply to us today. I know who I am. I'm going to get me some more women. I realize I'm a king. Okay. That was really a right and privilege of the king in those days. King could have any woman he wanted, otherwise, and concubines, concubines is a side chick. I hope we don't have no concubines sitting up here in church today. But you know, the concubines are winning today. They become the queen consort. You just got to know your history. <laughs> got to know your history. Got to keep up with current events. But it really was a right and privilege of a king. Because remember, when he had a committed adultery with Bathsheba, the prophet said to him, you could have any woman you want, but not another man's wife. Okay? So that was, so, it, so, I, so don't lose the revelation with this point. But he, he's saying here, he started acting and operating and enjoying the benefits of being a king once he internalized he was indeed the king. And it was a, took a process because that's not how he was born. It was a process because that's not where he came from. It's not like he was sitting back like Charles waiting for 75 years, one day I'm going to be king. This was not any, on, in his, on his vision board. This was not a hope, it wasn't a dream. It was not anything that he ever could conceive of. But God put him in this position and he was the least in his father's house. His father didn't even want to acknowledge him. Never mind the whole nation now see him as king. But he got to the place that he perceived. He started knowing in his knower. I am who God said I am. And he moved from Hebron to Jerusalem. Let me deal with that real quickly. Hebron represented where David started to reign. But Jerusalem is where he was destined to reign. Y'all didn't catch that. Some of, you, some of you need to understand that where you are, where you're starting right now is not where you're supposed to end. What you have right now is not all you're supposed to have. Where you're living right now is not where you're supposed to die. What you're driving right now is not your ultimate car. This may be where you started, but this is not your destiny. I'm preaching better than you're responding right now. So he moved from Hebron to Jerusalem. Hebron was where David reigned over part of the kingdom. But Jerusalem is where he raised over the, reigned over the entire kingdom. Come on, touch somebody and tell them, tell them there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. I know you got this, you got, but there's more. God, 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 there's more that God wants you to put your hands to. There's more he wants you to reign over. There's more he wants you to dominate. There, God, I see increase all around you. Oh, God's getting ready to enlarge your territory because there is more. This ain't it. There is more. I know you're enjoying it, but there's more. I know this comfortable, but there's more. And God's stretching you right now while I'm preaching. God's stretching your mind. He's stretching your vision. He's stretching your dreams because he's saying there's more. He promised where David reigned over part Jerusalem, but he moved to Jerusalem where he reigns over the entire king, kingdom. Last thing, Hebron is where David operated in limited authority. In limited authority, but Hebron is where he operated in complete authority. And until you perceive who you are, you're not going to operate in your complete authority. You tolerate things you don't have to tolerate. You put up with things you don't have to put up with. You be quiet, you'll be quiet when you ought to speak up. You'll be more concerned about what other people think about you than what God says about you. But God's saying, I want you to recognize today you are not average come on everyone standing with me today this is not your average church I'm not your average pastor 
we are not the average Christians and you are not average come on put your head back say I am not average look us catch somebody's eye around you and tell them I refuse to be average the next time somebody well, who, asks you who you think you are say, do you really want to answer because I don't think I know I know I'm a king I know I'm royalty I know I've been raised up to sit with him in heavenly places I know I'm the head not the tail I'm above not beneath that just and, and it, so what's unfortunate it could be another Christian we were in a mall yesterday I didn't see it and usually it's women who the way Pastor Mark said this guy acted usually women who act but I oh I was in Atlanta anyway um, I was in Atlanta all you women tell me, I'm going to go to Atlanta and get me mad. No, no, you better stay right. Stay right here in Blythewood. Stay right here in West Columbia. It's easy for me to believe when you get a man right here. Yeah, for you to go there. What's that mean? Back out of this? See, Pastor Mark, look at me going. We were in the mall. They just come out of a particular designer store, and uh, it was a big, big bag. And uh, I told the man, I said, he said, I'm sorry, this is all we have. I said, you're trying to get me hit over the head. Anyway, but it was, it was okay. And so I'm walking, and Pastor Marshall said, I didn't see the man. He said, this man looked at me and said, He wasn't studying him. I obviously wasn't thinking about him. People can look at you. They can say things. They can make all kinds of assumptions. But as long as you don't have the grasshopper mentality. Numbers 13, it says that when they got ready to go take the land, they said we are grasshoppers in their sight and in our sight. They can look at you however they want to look at you. Don't you get a grasshopper mentality. You are a conqueror. Let I me mean, say this, to go with this point I made today. The children of Israel, they could have went and got the promised land 40 years before they got there. When they finally get there, Rahab says, we heard of how God defeated the Pharaoh and his army and brought you across the Red Sea. We heard of the kings who you defeated in the wilderness. And Rahab said, we was waiting for y'all. And the fear of the people has, the, the people have been fearing y'all were coming to get this land ever since we heard that happened 40 years prior. And the people were already scared of them. And they were scared to go get what God had already given them. This way the Lord gave me that. What you're scared to go get is scared you're going to come get it. You didn't catch that. What you're scared to go get is scared you're going to come get it. I want you to take this word and live your life in abundance. Don't make apologies about promotion. Don't make apologies about increase. But now let me add this, add this qualification. Let, the, let God bring you. I, I didn't tell you to go charge up all your credit cards this week. I'm, I'm going to live above average. That don't mean you're supposed to have above average debt either. But get rid of this small living mentality. Get rid of this limited thinking. Get rid of this, that's for them, but not for me because of my background or where I came from or my family. They didn't know, so they couldn't have. If they did what you did, they could have what you have. Pastor Marshall often has, has, reminds me of that. She says, uh, she says, everybody, she says, everybody, they don't know your history. 
I said, well, I don't say why. She said, well, if they did what you did, they would have what you have. Those of you who get promoted on jobs, managers and supervisors and directors and chairs and all that, you start seeing other people's work. You say, man, these folks are trifling. How, how, how are they ever, how do these people work like this? If they did what you did, then they would be the director. They would be the supervisor. They would be the manager. And most people are going to do average. That's why it's called average. But that's not you. Come on, somebody say, that's not me. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let's make this confession together. Father, I thank you that you raised me up to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You raised me up so I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the lender, not the borrower. I'm the healed and not the sick. I'm the rich and not the poor. Thank you, Lord, for raising me up and everyone connected to me. Thank you, Lord, because of me, you're raising up my family. You're raising up my children. I am a bridge builder. I am a generation restorer. I am someone who clears, who clears our paths in the wilderness. You're using me to be an example of what a man or woman who fears God can do, can be, can have. I am not average in Jesus' name. Amen.